nor'easter. Hurricane force winds that blow from the northeast threaten people on land and sailors at sea. Blizzards. Winter storms cause mayhem on Canada's highways. Flash floods. When thunderstorm rains rush through concrete canals, you'd better get out of the way. Powerful storms. And the people who survive them. Coming up on Storm Warning. Every winter, the eastern seaboard of the United States is visited by an unwanted guest. It may bring ice, rain, or floods, but it always brings wind, blowing hard out of the northeast. It's called a nor'easter, named by the seafarers who have faced the savage northeasterly winds for centuries. Nor'easters are close relatives of hurricanes. But unlike hurricanes, these storms last days instead of hours. Testing survival skills on land and at sea. Most people won't go out in a nor'easter. We didn't see any other sailboats out that day. Dr. Mike Frasia and his sailing partner, Phil Pape, set sail knowing a nor'easter is brewing. The two experienced sailors are determined to deliver Fraysia's sailboat, the Carpe Diem, to its winter home in Newport, Rhode Island. I had heard from Phil that the weather was really going to be horrendous. And despite that, I told them we were leaving anyway. I had commitments to my family, and we were going to leave uh, midnight, Friday night, early Saturday morning, come hell or high water. Just looking back, I guess I got them both, hell and high water. Nor'easters are massive storm systems that hurl towering waves and high winds at the Atlantic coast. I've seen the power of the waves it was a little overwhelming and a little frightening, to say the least. Off the coast of New England, DeWitt Smith's family built a summer home on Nantucket Island's exposed shore, despite the risks. It was a three-bedroom cottage that had a front porch that looked due east. An eastern exposure is a dangerous orientation, 100 feet from the shoreline. It's nor'easters, not people, that draw that line, according to Dr. Hugh Willoughby of the Atlantic Meteorological and Oceanographic Labs. Nature is constantly rearranging beaches. So legal documents down at the courthouse may say that you own the land, but you're really just renting it from the ocean. Come a nor'easter, coastline may suddenly be on the shoreward side of where your beachfront house is. Nor'easters form when warm, low-pressure systems from the Gulf Stream crash into cold, high-pressure systems from the Arctic. When the two air masses meet, the warm air tries to travel over the cold air. This movement creates condensation and high winds. Here, a nor'easter's counterclockwise rotation is evident. The rotation is why the storms whip the coastline with northeasterly blasts. The duration is a big factor in how destructive it's going to be, because if it's a big storm, it takes a long time to pass. There's a lot of room for the wind to raise big waves, and the big waves go on for a long time. The nor'easter churns up waves as high as 12 feet. For the first six hours, Mike Frasia's sailboat handles the rough sea. But then, the nor'easter raises the stakes. We took 
two really big waves right in succession over the, the starboard side of the boat. After the first wave, I noticed that the rudder was frozen and we really had no steerage of the boat. Mike rushes below to check the steering mechanism. It's completely jammed. The boat is unsteerable. Now there's no way to navigate or head into the waves at a safe angle. The sail, whipping its 60 mile an hour winds, must be taken down, or the skipper fears the boat may jive and tip over. Run it! Yeah, go! Go! The tension on the line of the sail quadruples as the wind speed doubles. And for the two of us to wrestle this sail in, it literally took us five minutes just to pull that sail down and get it on the deck. The 40-foot sailboat now floats, a sitting duck in the raging waves. Mayday, mayday. We have lost our steering. Mayday, mayday. Come in, please. Use Coast Guard, mayday. When we come back, a daring rescue in the teeth of a nor'easter. And a howling blizzard traps drivers in sub-zero weather. The fierce winds of the storm called a nor'easter build still higher. For the crew of the rudderless Carpe Diem off the coast of the Atlantic, there is no hope in sight. U.S. Coast Guard, Mayday, Mayday. A Coast Guard cutter and any chance of rescue is still miles away. Skipper Mike Frasia is just trying to hang on. They assured me that a boat would be here within 20 minutes. Knowing the seas and the conditions that we were in, that we were in 12-foot swells, I knew that that 20-minute estimate was not realistic. Mike and his crewmate can do nothing but wait. Back on Nantucket Island, the Nor'easter batters homes like DeWitt Smith's. This was relentless. It never let up. The rain just didn't stop. The wind just didn't stop. But what's worse are the waves. Each carries three tons of force per square foot. Smith's summer home is slammed as the waves surge far above the high tide mark, and the nor'easter creates a new shoreline. It went totally intact, like watching a ship that had been christened and just slide down the embankment into the sea. And finally, I remember a wave coming and washing out the back wall. And then the next wall of water came over, and a side wall went out. You could almost see the remaining walls just fall down into the water. It was just like watching matchsticks. In just minutes, the Nor'easter turns this and many other homes on this stretch of the coast into splintered debris. Miles out at sea, the Coast Guard has still not reached Mike Frasia's sailboat. The real thing that was concerning me was that if one of us got washed overboard, that person was dead. I mean, I can throw him a life preserver, but I can't even reach him at that point. Finally, a 40-foot Coast Guard vessel arrives. Uh, Roger, break, break, Carpe Diem, um, 447. But the boat's too small to tow the Carpe Diem. It takes another hour and a half for the second boat, a 47-footer, to make its way to the scene. When we were down in a trough and they were down in a trough, even the big boat that finally showed up on scene, you, all you could see was a little blue light. A Coast Guardsman throws a tow line. Mike grabs it. Slowly, the Coast Guard vessel begins to pull the crippled boat to safer waters. I have tremendous respect for the men and women of the Coast Guard because they saved our life. You know, and I can't thank them enough. Mike Frasia's sailboat emerges from the Nor'easter in one piece. The name of the boat is Carpe Diem. That's uh, Latin for seize the day. It's fair to say, in retrospect, that that day seized us. 
The storm has seized seven homes on Nantucket Island. Along with DeWitt Smith's passion for life by the sea. When I saw this storm work firsthand, that was the first time I ever realized the very high price that anyone pays to have water from. For myself, I, I'd never want to live near the water again. Mike Frasia and Phil Pape have not lost their passion for sailing. But it isn't likely that a nor'easter will ever find them in its path again. I've always had respect for the weather and the sea. I gained a lot more respect. Coming up, Canadian winters wreak havoc on the road. And flash floods cause a desperate struggle for survival. Cars and cold. On Canada's highways, they often collide. She's a bit shaken up, but she's okay. A winter storm turns a Toronto road into a hockey rink. The blizzard has dusted a layer of snow over black ice. A firefighter is too shocked to react at first. Then he hurries to order a dazed crash survivor out of harm's way. Stop here. Get off the road! Get off the road! Get the hell off the road! Who else is in your car? Get the hell off the road! Another survivor coughs to catch her breath. We've got well, six vehicles in one spot, and I think we got a few up ahead. we got a few cars in the ditches, and we got some people hurt here, too. Scenes like this are part of the treachery of Canadian winters. From December to January, the polar jet stream sweeps out of Alaska, east across the prairie, bearing storms. Motorists are at the mercy of these icy blasts. In the western province of Saskatchewan, a whiteout turns deadly on the Trans-Canada Highway. A jackknife truck has thrown a boy from his car and pinned him in freezing water up to his neck. His core temperature is dropping dangerously. A tow truck is called in. Rescuers rush to secure cables that will lift the weight off the trapped boy. Finally, he is free. For Canadian drivers, winter's worst worry is being trapped in a blizzard on a remote stretch of road. When your gas runs out, your heater stops. Within hours, you can freeze to death. Four days after Christmas, Canada's westernmost province of British Columbia is battered by the worst storm in a century. It starts with what's known as the Pineapple Express. Warm tropical moisture, blown up from Hawaii, collides with cold Arctic air to create a colossal blizzard. Snow paralyzes the Fraser Valley, two hours east of Vancouver. Trouble starts when Mounties close the freeway. Cars taking the back road soon get trapped by blowing snow. Robert Brown and his family are in one of them. We were following other cars along this road that was almost visible with the snow blowing across it. And suddenly they were stopped in front of us. A truck up ahead said, well, there's just somebody stuck. It'll be a few minutes and they'll be out. Uh, the few minutes turned into nine hours. Not only is the Brown family stranded, now they face the danger of being buried alive as snow piles up and frozen to death in minus 20 degree temperatures. Central Fraser Valley Search and Rescue, Central Fraser Valley Search and Rescue, all members... A local search and rescue team, led by Dave Dungey, gets the call. We knew that there were some people trapped, and we knew that somebody was injured, and that we had to get that person out of that area right away. And then the weather started to even get worse. But as Dungey's rescue effort begins, heavy snowfall, whipped by winds of 100 miles per hour, buries all the roads. Snow plows are useless now. We couldn't even get to where the people were. We had to wait till front end loaders came in to clear a path for us. And then as we went in there, our convoy started to get stranded also. 
blocked by drifts up to 10 feet deep, the search and rescue team is forced to continue on foot. Braving brutal cold, they search every car for the stranded. That's too much. Can you see that? There's a, there's a sweater in there. Yeah. On the driver's side, right? It's hard to tell. We followed each other to the different vehicles. And the winds were 100 miles an hour. We are weaving in between cars with four-foot-high snow drifts all around them. In the matter of time that we left to get this person, our rescue vehicle froze solid. Unable to get vehicles in or out, Dungy's team can't evacuate the stranded. Nor can they leave them in their cars to perish from the cold. So they turn to the local farmers. And the Abbotsford police got all the phone numbers to the people in that area and, and asked them to turn their lights on and to take people in when needed. Farmhouse lights start turning on. Rescuers hustle to guide the stranded to safety. Uh, you should go to the house. What's that? You all should go to the house. Get ready. You can stay in here. We are checking in the nearby house if they're going to take them in. It was cold tonight, huh? Oh, yeah. Come on with me, gentlemen. Robert Brown and his family are among the rescued. They started bringing people from the back of the line first to the farmhouse in groups of half a dozen or ten people at a time, and a hundred people from where we were stuck on the road got into one farmhouse. They'll stay at the packed farmhouse because no snowplow gets through the next day. Powerful gusting winds pile snow higher and higher. <sighs> The only way that we could get them out was to search all the vehicles along the way and rescue all the people out of the uh, houses and come in by train the next day. Morning reveals how motorists were able to get from their cars to the train. As people emerge from shelters, there are joyful reunions. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> Not a single life is lost in the Fraser Valley blizzard, but stranded cars are everywhere. Work begins to dig out from the huge drifts, and people are grateful to those who braved the fierce Canadian elements to save them from the snow. In an emergency, it really pays off for a community to have people like that around who can be called upon to help. Up next, hanging on for dear life in a flash flood. Every summer in the American Southwest, the skies over New Mexico put on a glorious electric light show. But with the beauty comes the rain and the danger. Nestled in the Sandia Mountains is the desert city of Albuquerque. When rain runs down the mountain slopes, it rushes into storm-carved gulches that Spanish settlers called arroyos. Three decades ago, engineers began paving the arroyos over, rushing flood water right through the city. The rainfall that we get will produce an enormous amount of runoff. Rene Vermeeren works to control flash floods for the Army Corps of Engineers. Whenever it rains in this area, it's basically a flash flood type situation. The force of the water, it can be anywhere from five miles an hour to 30 miles an hour. It can move cars. And when a car is trapped with the baby inside, rescuers are almost swept away in the struggle to save him. When you have flash floods and people get in the water, they get hurt. If someone gets in there, they're helpless. Police Sergeant John Bodie learned this lesson on a summer day when two skateboarders ventured into the arroyo. That day, the arroyo was dry, it was sunny, and then the next thing we know, here comes this wall of water. The torrent from a thunderstorm far upstream engulfs two skateboarders. A rescue line is strung for Peter Alvarado and his brother David. John Bodie has slipped trying to help the boys and fallen in. With one arm, he now hangs on for dear life. 
Other officers desperately try to help Modi as he struggles against the cascading torrent. The water's cold, it's moving very rapidly. It's unbelievable what can happen. On the other side, Peter Alvarado is being pummeled by the same cold, deadly force. Flipped over by the pounding flood water, Bodhi chokes on the torrent, slamming him in the face. He rolls on his back to breathe. Muscles in one arm strain taut as the rope cuts into his hand. The saving grace on that was I was still wearing my bulletproof vest. I was able to hydroplane on the water for a little bit, and I was able to take some of the, the impact and disperse it with the vest. Finally, another policeman edges in with a rescue strap. With what little strength he has left, Bodhi grabs hold of it. But the water rips the strap from his grasp as his colleagues stand by, unable to help. At this point, I was just trying to survive. I'd become from a rescuer to a rescuee. Finally, rescuers pull Bodhi from the raging floodwaters. His hand hangs limp from the nerve and joint damage caused by his ordeal. The policeman is rushed to a nearby hospital, shivering with cold. The boy he was trying to save has been knocked off the rope by debris. Teams of rescuers comb the flood channels looking for him. Others try to help and also slip down the steep arroyo walls into the deadly river. Two of our guys grabbed hands and tried reaching out to grab him. The kid came by and grabbed him, and they both went in. That day, 10 others who tried to save the Alvarado brothers are pulled from the swollen channels. Despite a long search, Peter Alvarado does not survive his battle with the raging water. Today, Sergeant Bodie conducts a personal campaign to keep children out of Albuquerque's deadly concrete channels. Kids like to play in the Arroyos because it's a forbidden place. I don't care who you are. If you play in the flood channel and there's rain, you're going to get hurt. It's that simple. Few men know more about the lethal power of water. Why on earth would any person think that they can do battle with that? You're not going to survive.